Anyways, some people are lying. I know that's not, not everybody loves Christmas music, but I do. I do. Now, there's, there's something that I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys also love to do, all right? And this is my family. We love to do this. Is this, this is the time of year that we like to go stalking other people's houses. Anybody? Who likes to drive around and look at Christmas lights, right? And whoever, who does that? Just get in the car. I'm like, what are you going to do today? Let's just go for a drive. I mean, who goes for a drive anymore, right? I mean, that was kind of like a thing back in the day. I was, what are you going to do? Let's just go for a drive. And I was like, I mean, this is the only time that we say, what do you want to do? Let's just go for a drive. Let's just go into places that we shouldn't be and like slow creep in people's neighborhoods, right? It's like the weirdest thing I think that we do. And what's interesting about going to Christmas lights and checking out Christmas lights is uh, it's the time of the year that we just love to judge one another, <laughs> right? You get in your car, all you do, you get in your car for an hour plus and just judge people, all right? And my kids do that. I'm like, oh, you know, yo, those lights, you know, I like to do that too, getting ideas for next year. I'm like, oh, I love that. Oh, I want to do that. I was like, oh, and then you, you, you know, or like, <laughs> Did you, did you see what that guy did? Oh, my gosh. Right? You see one of those? I'm like, why even bother? Oh, did you see that? He just threw, like, two lights around a bush. That's it. I'm like, why even bother doing that? And so my kids would do that. My, my kids like to judge. And so to this year, they had a rating system. Right? We're driving down neighborhoods, and they're going, oh, the house is a five. The house is a three. The house is a seven. The house is a ten. Right? So here we are just judging everything, everyone. And then one of my oldest, he go, my oldest goes, uh, No offense to anyone in this car, but our house is a five. (laughs) No offense. You're talking about me, bro. I was like, right? I was like, he's judging me. He judges my work. I'm like, let me see what you can do next year, all right? You put up the Christmas lights. Let me judge you next year. See what you can, even you can get close to a five. Anyways. And so, right, that, that, that time of year is fun. I like to do it. We all like to do it. And then I was thinking as we're driving around at night, you know, it's fun. But then I started to appreciate how easy it is to drive at night when you have light, right? Especially around Christmas time because when the houses are all lit, whew, everything is just out there. Everything is super bright. But then I was trying to imagine, you know, like, man, we all know what it's like, and I know what it's like to walk around anywhere when it's dark. Like, I couldn't imagine driving, right, without, in the middle of the night without street lights, driving in the middle of the night without lampposts. Could you imagine driving at night with no headlights? Driving at night in the dark. I mean, that's, in the, oh my gosh, no, forget that. I was in Puerto Rico, forget it. And I was like, I don't even want to drive that in the day sometimes. That's crazy over there. And so I literally, in Puerto Rico, saw, we saw somebody there, four-wheel, flipped four times, landed on the four wheels, and dude just took off. I'm like, what? And so, anyways, so um, the ones who liked that the most were the Puerto Ricans in the house. And so anyways, the, so it's it's hard to get around. It's hard to get around at night because you need light. And so we all know what it's like to even get around the house in your own house when the power goes out, right? That's one of the most depressing sounds for, it, it causes this massive anxiety. No matter how deep of a sleep Alicia will be in, or me too, Right? When the power goes out and you hear the air conditioning shutting off. Anybody hear one of those? <laughs> She's like, oh, I'm up. I was like, I can't go to bed now. She knows, like, it's going to be hot. I'm gonna, I can't go to sleep, right? And you ever do when the lights go out, you, when, when the power goes out, you just turn lights on. So that way you know when the power goes back on, when the whole light just, boom, right? When it just catch, catches back like that. And so put the radio on or do different things like that. And so it, it's, it's not easy, right? It's not easy to get around in the dark. I have literally broken both of my pinky toes 76 times, right, each, trying to walk around in the dark, right? All right? We've all done that. I've done that. Even the, yesterday, I almost ruined Christmas uh, this last week because the whole living room was off, super dark, and we put our Christmas tree in a new place that's normally not where it's at. So I took, I tend to take sharp corners sometimes when I walk in, you know, in the house and I took a sharp corner smack into the tree. And so like, I'm just glad I didn't like knock it over. I mean, I almost did, but I was like, I had a car. I was like, making sure she didn't see me. I was like, oh no. And so, but, uh, but you know, it's hard to walk around at night. It's hard to walk around at night and you know, in the house too, and the power goes out, you know, we all know what that's like. But then I know, I know, I know I'm not the only one who knows this or feels this. When it's hard to move when you find yourself in a dark place, right? Same thing. When there's no light, when, there's no, when the power is out, right, hope is out. When the lights are out, hope is out. And when you can't see how this is going to work or how am I going to get from here to there or I don't even see it there, 
I can't even see that my own hand in front of me. It's hard to move when you're in a dark place emotionally, right, mentally. I mean, can I even, can somebody, like, you know, am I only, only one who says it? you don't even want to move when you're in a dark place? Am I, am I right on that? When you find yourself in a dark place, you don't even want to move. It's just like this weight is just uh, there. And so what, we, what I wanted, what we're going to talk about today is like in the same way when the power goes out of your house, right, there's nothing that you can do necessarily to go, you know, unless, I mean, maybe one person might, I don't know in the house, but, you know, there's very little that anybody here can do to make the power come back on, right? If the power goes out in the block, you don't have the skill, the access, right, the, the ability to, br- to restore power. You just have to do what in the dark? Wait. You have to wait in the dark. You just have to wait for the power to be restored. And so in the same way, when power goes out, we have hard men and women working to restore power. We're going to look at today how God is hard at work and has been hard at work since the beginning to restore power, to restore connection between us and him. And that's why we're in this series called Unto Us, because this is not a God who calls us to come to him. This is a God who came unto us. In fact, that right there is the number one different, the biggest difference between Christianity and any other religion. Because I'm pretty sure some of you have heard the phrases, some of you have heard the uh, descriptions, right? That, well, all religions are the same, all roads lead to the same place. We're all pretty much the same, but, you know, maybe there's differences between this religion, that religion, that religion. But they're all the, the same. You know, I, I heard it this one week. It's like if God was on top of a mountain and we're all at the bottom of the mountain, we're all taking different routes, but we're all going up the mountain, so we're all going to make it to him. And so that's what a lot of people tend to believe. But the difference is, is this. is like, what if we couldn't make it? What if there was no road to go up? The biggest difference between most every single religion, and especially what is Christ and Christian, and what we believe in the Judeo-Christian Bible is this. See, we can't go to him. The God on top of the mountain came down to us and made a way through Jesus. That's the biggest difference. Then no, uh, no one else can point to that. And that's why this is so huge, that God is hard at work and has been hard at work to restore the connection between us and him. And he is still hard at work today to making sure that he can restore any connection that we feel might be lost or is flickering for whatever reason. He is hard at work to restore that connection. And so we're going to look at, we've been looking at, uh, last week we started a series, and we've been looking at this book in Isaiah, which is a prophet that lived 700 years before Jesus. So we're taking a very unconventional Christmas approach. We're not talking about, a lot, we're not starting in the Gospels, we're not starting with wise men and shepherds. We're starting with a, with a dude who lived 700 years before Jesus. But the reason why we're starting with this guy is because 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah was prophesying about what was going to happen, about what Jesus was going to do. And around this time in Israel, they were living in a dark place. They were in a dark place. In fact, it was so dark, and the reason why is not because God forgot them. It's not because God ignored them. It's because the people chose to walk away from God, who is light. They walked away from the light of God and his ways and ended up in a dark place. And because no one was listening, because everybody was hard of hearing, they couldn't see, God sent this man, Isaiah, with a message to people in a dark place about regardless of where they had gone, he was pointing them to something that God was going to do temporarily But ultimately, he was pointing to Jesus, something that happened 700 years later. And what's crazy is that Isaiah saw this, saw what God was doing, and he was giving us glimpses. And now today we can see, wow, the probabilities of what had happened, what he had spoken and wrote to happen 700 years later is a big deal. So let's look at this one story here. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 9, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. In fact, just to prove it to you that these guys are in such a dark place, I don't have it up here, but right before chapter 9 starts... I'm going to read this. Isaiah says in chapter 8, he says in, the verse, in verse 22, And they will look to the earth, and behold, they will find themselves in distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. So this is where they're at. They will be thrust into thick darkness. But in verse chapter 9, verse 1, it says, say that first word for me. What is it? Say it again, everybody. What's the first word? 
but, if you remember last week, we said one of the applications was, if you find, add a but when you find yourself in a rut. When you find yourself in a situation like, oh, this sinks, this, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know God is faithful, but I choose to trust him, but. So I love this, and I say, man, these guys will find themselves in darkness, but, look at this, I love it, but there will be no gloom. There will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Pause. He is all those little funky name phrases, words that, you know, I don't even think I pronounced correctly. All of those are parts of northern Israel. Last week, we had talked about how this time, the northern tribes, the northern, you know, there's, there's been a civil war happening here in Israel, the land of, you know, land of God, the people of God. They've broken up into a northern kingdom, southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom was now under threat and at this point had been destroyed by Assyria. And now Assyria was knocking on the door of Judah about to take and finish everything off and then Babylon later would come in. And so here they are. He is talking about the northern tribes are in a dark place because they're done. They have been overcome. They have been overwhelmed. They abandoned their God and they chose to live a certain way and now God allowed them to live according to the consequences of their sin. Listen, if all you ate, could you imagine if we ate from January to November the way we eat in the month of December? What consequences are you going to have, right? What consequences are you going to have if you eat like that, right? Because we always, this month is the time we eat the most. And so it just happens. Consequences, two decisions. And so this is what happened. These guys are in a dark place, but God says, those people who have abandoned me, those people who've rejected me, some, I'm going to do something in them through them. And by the way, that last little spot, Galilee to the nations, wait till we get back to that in a little bit. But look what he says now in verse, in verse 5. The people who walked in darkness have seen a what? A great light. Those who dwelt in the land of darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nations. He's talking about God. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest and as they, as, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulders, the rod of his oppressors, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. God's not playing around. Like here, he is literally saying, when he says a light has shown, and this light is not this illumination like, oh, I got a bright idea. Okay, this light has shown, meaning someone has shown up. Notice all the you and what you and you. God is going to do something incredible on behalf of his people. He's going to, what it's going to happen when it says there increases their joy. It's like this Hebrew phrase where it's like, it's literally this. It's like, <gasps> you know, it's like when you were a kid and you got that toy that you wanted for Christmas. You were hoping, oh, if I could just get this one toy for Christmas. And then you open it up and that big, <gasps> it's right, it's in my hands, right? That increase of joy. That's what he's talking about. That God is going to do something that is just going to make the whole nation gasp. And their joy is going to increase. The, na the multi, you know, it says he will multiply the nations. The family of God is going to be grown. The enemies of God are going to be trampled, destroyed. That's what God was going to do. And so, whoa, who is this guy who's going to show up? Who is this person who's going to do it? And then he says in verse 5, no, in verse 6, a child will be born. A kid? You know, a kid's going to do this? A child will be born a son would be what? Given. Come back to that one. That's an interesting phrase that Isaiah said 700 years before Jesus lived. A child will be born, but notice that while this child is born, a, technically a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called, look at this phrase, this wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Of the increase of government and of peace, there will be no end. There will be no end for on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. From this time forth and for how long? Forevermore. And I love this line. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do it. Another phrase and they're saying God is going to do it himself. He's not going to, he don't need you to do it. 
He does, he's not going to. No, he will do it himself. Now, this is a really interesting phrase, guys, for us to understand and process what Isaiah is saying 700 years before a donkey shows up. 700 years before a girl, a teenager named Mary said yes to an angel. 700 years before that, he's saying a child will be born. It will be a son that will be given. And this son, his name will be Mighty God. This is, wait, so God's going to show up. God's going to come and do this. But he's going to come as a baby? He's going to be, he's going to be one of, he's going to be like us? He's going to become us? How could that happen? When, how, where? Well, it doesn't matter. He says God's going to do it. He's going to do the impossible. How could that happen? Don't worry about it. God's going to do it. Well, I don't got an answer for this. I don't know. How, how is it? This says it's impossible. Well, what, the, what should we say? Well, God's going to do it. I, I don't know what I can do. It's like, what, God, seriously? Well, no. God's going to? He's going to do it. He's going to do it. This is something that is when we read it in context, I'm like, what? Oh, my gosh. And by the way, in this, there's, there's a part one and a part two where he talks about how this light will shine. This light will come into the world. It will be a child that will be born. A son will be given. But then this whole, the establishing of the kingdom, guys, guess what? Good news. That hasn't happened yet. It's about to, though, soon. It'll happen one day. God came to us once, and he's coming back again to finish what this, what his calling was all about. And so here we see, he's like, man, what I love about this is, again, where, who are these people? Who was God, who was Isaiah talking to? People who were in what? In darkness. And I love this because it shows us that the darkness of the people of Israel, the darkness, their darkness did not cancel out God's love for them. Their darkness did not cancel out God's love. They were there out of their choices, out of the consequence of their decisions. All they had, they had done and become was their fault. And yet God comes down not to finish them off, not to kick them while they're down. He showed up to shine a light and says, hey, I'm still here. I still love you. Let me show you a way out of that. That's our God. That's our God. And so we see that with this people, how amazing that it didn't matter the darkness. And remember, Isaiah said, thick darkness thick darkness. It didn't matter. I don't care how thick the darkness is. Light always penetrates darkness. Light always cuts through darkness. I don't care how thick that darkness is. I don't care how thick that darkness is. Darkness did not cancel out God's love for his people. And then 700 years later, we see a different conversation with somebody in the dark. Some of you may know this. I know a lot of you know this verse. Even for if you haven't been to church in a while, this is your first time ever coming to church, I know you've heard this verse. One of the most spoken and simplified, condensed verses there is. It is John 3.16. Now, some of you don't, maybe you know the context, but the context is really interesting. The conversation between Jesus speaks of John 3.16. John, you know, re recounting this, writing this down years later, probably in a conversation that Nicodemus, this guy who Jesus so told it to, Probably had a conversation with John as they were retelling this and the spirit leading them to and he wrote this down. It's a great, great conversation. But see, what's happening is there was a man named Nicodemus who was a believer in Jesus, but he was afraid. So here's the thing about Nicodemus. He was a religious leader. He was a Pharisee. He was one of the top dogs there. And all of everybody and his crew that were rolling with, they didn't like Jesus. They were intimidated by Jesus. They were constantly plotting against Jesus. But Nicodemus is there sitting, just kind of low-key quiet watching. I'm like, yo, hold on, man. I don't know. Well, some of the stuff he's saying, some of the stuff he's doing, I, I don't know if we should be fighting this guy. I, I think we need to lean in more. But he was afraid. He was afraid of what would happen to him if he came out and said, he might lose his job. He might lose his reputation. Nicodemus was considered to be one of the wealthiest dudes in, the ta in town. Who knows what was at stake? He was struggling with a lot. But then, so he, what happens is, is right before this verse that we're going to read, he meets, he wants to meet with Jesus. Guess what time? At night. He meets with him in the, in the thickness, in, 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 in the dark, because he doesn't want anyone to know who he's talking to. He's scared. He meets with him at night, and how interesting that Nicodemus goes to meet in the dark, goes to have a conversation with the light of the world. So cool. 
And there Nicodemus is asking him these questions and trying to see who he is. And that's when Jesus, he lays down this bomb right here on John 3.16. But we're going to go a little further than this. John 3.16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. What did Isaiah say 700 years before Jesus spoke those words? That a child would be born and a son given. Jesus, 700 years later, says because of the love of God, a son would be given. The father would give a son. And those who believed in him would have eternal life. But let's keep going because, you know, it gets good after that. For God did not send this son, he did not send this light into the world to condemn the world. But in order, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Again, he didn't come down to make us feel bad to say, what have you done? He didn't do that to condemn us. He did that to save us. Whoever believes in him, he's repeating a little bit more, going back to 316. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Listen, that condemnation, that's a beautiful thing for so many of us because so how many, and this is me, if you're a Christian, you get me. If you're not, I think you, maybe it's a little differently, but man, how often do we beat ourselves up? How often do we beat ourselves up? I'm like, oh, well, I guess I'm not doing, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not good enough Christian. I, sh I should be reading the Bible more. Oh, I feel guilty. I'm like, oh, I'm not doing this. I feel guilty. You know, or you do different things, which is, and there's part of a reality there that you have to acknowledge that, yeah, you don't, you are not enough. You are not enough. You are not good enough. You cannot be good enough. Can you be good? Yeah, but according to whose definition? Now we can debate that all day. You're not good enough. We all acknowledge that. And then God doesn't come down here to remind you once again what a piece of whatever you are, that you're worth dirt and nothing else. No, he doesn't come down to condemn us. And those, when we believe in him, we don't have to be condemned. We are free from performance when you believe in Jesus. You are free from performance when you know that that's your dad now forever. And you're his kid. You are free from performance Look, my kids have drawn the most pathetic drawings in the history of art. But I love them. I don't, I don't look at that. I'm like, did you keep the receipt? Because we got to return this kid. I don't know. I don't know. No, we don't do that. You know, I mean, how many of us, I mean, it doesn't matter. We are free from performance when you believe in Jesus. You are free from that. Now you don't have to earn that love. You don't have to do, Daddy, look at me. You don't have to do any of those things because his eyes are on you. Because he loves you because he's now your dad and you believe. But if you choose not to, Jesus doesn't mince words. Jesus doesn't come down to condemn anybody. But if you reject him, you are condemned. You condemn yourself. God's not condemning you. You condemn yourself. But let's keep on going. Check this out here. Oof, this gets heavy right now. 19. You ready? Look at this. And this is the judgment. So let me just tell you how it is, Nicodemus. Let me just tell you right now how it is. Plain and simple. Light has come into, the, come into the world. 700 years later, right? Oh, by the way, remember when I said Galilee of the nations? Isaiah said of Galilee of the nations. This light will shine in the north, right? And there will be Galilee of the nations. Well, do you guys know where Jesus established his home base when he began his mission on the world? Galilee. So in the northern tribe, in this northern section that had such a crappy history, such a dark history, God chose to establish home base to tell the world about how much God loves still and that they are still loved. He chose the problem, you know, that area no one would want to start. Everyone would want to be in Jerusalem. That's where it's at. But he went to Galilee, a, a nomad, a backwater place. To show that, yeah, I love, I don't, I'm not just for the flash in the show. I, I'm trying to find everybody. Everybody. So interesting, Isaiah, 700 years later, a light will shine from Galilee. And that's where Jesus, the light of the world, shows up. But check this out. The light will go into the, the, a light has come. So he's saying what God is doing now. A light has come into this world. And the people, I wish I could have heard Jesus' tone. I think his heart must have dropped or his tone must have changed when he's about to say these next words. A light has come to the world and people, they love darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light 
and does not come into the light. At least their work should be exposed. That's a heavy phrase. That's a heavy phrase. You know, in the sense that, and that's actually one of the biggest reasons why people don't see God do things in their life. These are probably one of the biggest reasons why God doesn't move in as many Christians as he could and wants to. It is the number one reason why a lot of people refuse or that choose to not to believe in Jesus because they don't, people don't reject Jesus because it's complicated. I mean, it's, it's pathetically easy. God loves you. You're a sinner. You got to go. He came to save you. He died for you on the cross. All you got to do is believe. That's it. I mean, you can't mess this up. It's not complicated. People don't choose not to believe, not because, oh, I don't, that sounds too weird. People refuse to believe because they refuse to change. They don't want to change. They don't want to change. They don't want to change. They love their lifestyle too much. Guys, Jesus, is, his, his heart is still for us today. Listen, there's a lot of people who love their lifestyle so much they, they're going to end up losing their life. Your lifestyle is not worth it. It's not worth it. He is saying, you know, people refuse the light because they love the dark too much. People refuse the life that I want to give them because they like their lifestyle. They like calling the shots. They like to play God themselves and determining what is right and what is wrong. They like to play God and who judges, you know, you know, and who can be and who gets grace. They like to do that, but they, it's just not enough. It can't be. Take it again. If you go to a doctor, let's say, hey, you are dying from this disease, and hey, I got the cure for you right here, my guy. I got the cure for you right here. If you take this, you'll be healed. But if you refuse it, you're going to die. That's Jesus. That's what he's saying. He's like, look, if you refuse this, you stand, you condemn yourself. You condemn yourself. I mean, you love the darkness, but I love you, and I want you to see there is something better than what you have. There is something better than what you think is possible. But he says they love the dark too much. People don't want to change. They want it their way, my terms, my way. And they just want to use God as like, you know, like the magic genie. Like when you need him, he's kind of a little, you know, rub it, and he gets what you want, answers your prayers when you need it. All right, God, thank you. Put you back in the box. God don't want to, God don't fit in no box. He doesn't want to fit in your box. He can't. We look at Jesus then at the end. He says, but, but there's a different people. But it may be clear though, but I want you to see this. Uh, those who hate, they, those who do wicked things, they, they hate the light because it exposes them. It exposes them. They don't want to be exposed. They want to, they want to stay. They don't want to change. But whoever does, whoever does what is true comes to the light. So we see this connection between truth and light there. That it may be clear that his works have been carried out by God. You know what he is saying? The same thing Isaiah said. It's like those who believe in the truth, something is going to happen in their life. Those who believe in the truth, something is going to happen in them. Something is going to happen through them. That when people look at them, it's no individual could have said, what did you do? No, it's what did God do? See, it's the phrase right there that the works that have been carried out by God. Who's going to do it? God's going to do it. God's going to do it. That when those who trust in this truth and believe and receive this light, God will do something that only he can do. What did Isaiah say 700 years before this? The zeal of the Lord will do it. God himself is going to do something that only he can do. And so when we see these two parallels, a light shining in a darkness... What I love about that is that, listen, the light came down to those in darkness. Remember we said when you're in the dark, you just don't want to move. You almost feel like you can't. And there's a big truth to that. Because there is nothing you can do in and of yourself to fix it. All you can do is lie to yourself. Ooh, man, isn't that, I think that's one of the craziest things. How good we can be at believing our own lies. Right? Look how psychotic we are. You're like, you know you're lying to yourself. You know you're lying to yourself. And I'm like, yeah, you know, and you're like, yeah, you know what? You're right. <laughs> it's like, I'm crazy, right? All you can do is lie to yourself and deny the reality. But God said, no, 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 no. A light came down to those in the dark. And guys, that says so much about who our God is, that he doesn't have to wait. He doesn't wait for you to get your act together. He doesn't wait for you to get your act together. He doesn't wait for you to figure things out. He comes to you because he knows you can't by, without him. 
He comes to you. He comes to where you are in your whatever dark pit you're in. He's the God who jumps in it. The light came to those in the dark. Christ got off his throne, got uncomfortable being a human being. You think it would be interesting for God himself to be adored by angels one day, and then within 48 hours, his booty is being wiped by a teenage girl because he's a baby. He can't even do that for himself. Like, you know, whatever. He had to relearn how to talk and walk and do all this. And I mean, God got uncomfortable so he can find, so we can find comfort. He got uncomfortable so you and I can find comfort in him. A light came to those in the dark. You can't go. If you're in the dark, you can't go to him. A light came to us. And what's so awesome is about the light is that the presence, the presence of the light is proof of his love. The presence of that light is proof of his love. That's what Isaiah was telling those people. Like saying, yeah, you guys are messed up. You ruined it all. But guess what? God still loves you. The just darkness does not cancel out God's love for you. And Jesus is here saying, a light has come. This, that, that light that Isaiah was talking about, it's here. And it shows that the darkness that is existing now has not canceled out God's love for the world. Not just for Israel, for the world, because God loved the world so much. He gave. He gave. And then lastly, we see this thing where, listen, God refuses to abandon those who refuse to accept him. Just process that who God is for a second. I mean, we just sang a minute ago, let's come and adore God. Can you just adore God for that statement right there? He refuses to abandon those who refuse to accept him. He refuses to abandon those who refuse to accept him. Do you know, God knows those who love the darkness more than the light. Yet God doesn't select it, light and not shine here, there, and you know, he shines it on everyone. On everyone. God refuses to abandon those who refuse to accept him. And he points it out. He's like, look, a light has come. You saw Jesus' phrasing, right? Isaiah says a light will come. Isaiah's, Isaiah's message is, look what God is going to do. Pay attention. God's going to do something in the future. Look what he's going to do. Jesus' message is, look what God is doing. And now 2,000 years later, I can stand before you today. I was like, look what he has done. Look what he has done. He refuses to abandon us, yet it is us who refuse to accept him. If we love our darkness so much, we don't want to accept the light, or we love our lifestyle so much, then we end up losing our life in the process. God's saying that, that's a horrible trade-off. That's a horrible, horrible trade-off. And I want to show you this one for last verse here because I think it, it just kind of brings it all together because it puts it down to now where we are and it's this. And this is the, kind of like the big idea for the day because we're talking about light and dark. And I, I want you guys to know this. And that last phrase, what Jesus was saying about those who, are, those who believe are no longer condemned, but those who refuse to believe condemn themselves. Here's the truth and reality. Darkness only defines you if you let it. Darkness only defines you if you let it. Your dark circumstances, your excuses or your issues or your this or your that, whatever it is, it will only define you if you let it. If you let it. Because God is saying here, there is no condemnation in me. I, the light has shone in the darkness. I can do what you can't do. I can take you from where you are to where I want you to be. God doesn't say, hey, I want to take you from where you are to where you want to be. No, because see, God sees something different. He sees it better. He's a good dad. He says, I can take you from where you are to where you need to be, where I have, and it's the best for you. I can do it, but do you want to choose to walk in my light? Do you, ref do you choose to accept because when you do, then okay, I will take it. I will do the rest. If you receive, you know, if you believe, I will do the rest and take you there. But again, the darkness will only define you. Your past will only define you if you let it. The uncertainty of your future will only define you if you let it. But when you realize that a light has come, everything changes. Before I show you this one verse, do me a favor, close your eyes. Don't fall asleep on me. This is going to be quick. Don't close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. Okay, everyone has their eyes closed. Tell me, how bright is it right now? You're all in the dark, right? Can't see a thing. Everybody, if your eyes are closed, some of y'all ain't paying attention. Come on now, keep your eyes closed. You're all in the dark. You can't see a thing. But do you, know, but do you not know that there's a light in this room? 
a light has come. There is a present light here, but you guys are all right now in the dark. All you have to do is what? Open your eyes. Open your eyes now. When you open your eyes, you are allowing the light in. When you open your eyes, you allow the light in. And that's what Jesus is trying to say from the beginning. Whether you haven't placed your trust in God or whether you have, but maybe God is asking you to trust him in this specific area in your life. Listen, you can be like this all day long. You can't see anything. But God is saying if you just open your heart, if you open your heart and let the light in, let my truth in, let who I am in, that you see that I can do what you can't do. I will do it. I will do it if you open your eyes, if you open your heart to this truth. And so this is where, and I'm going to share this last, uh, this last verse here. Look at Romans, uh, not Romans, John 8, 12. Jesus in this, look at this context. Not too long later, he says this amazing statement in John 8, 12. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I am that light. I am that light. I've been there, guys. So many times I want to pray to God and I say, God, well, I, you know, I need this or I want that or I need this and, and I don't get it. And I know sometimes God's brought me to places where I was like, bro, when am I just going to be enough for you? And he's brought me to places like that repeatedly. When, can I just be enough or do you just want me to just tell you what to do all the time? Or are you just good with me being right here? You know, David once says, Lord, your light is like a lamp to my feet. And that's what the light of Jesus is. He's not this, you know, we see so much, but it's this light that gives us, here's the step that you need to take. Here's the step that you need to take. Go this way, go that way, trust me in this. That's the light. He says, with you, those who have me, I am that light. I am, it's me, it's, it's me, Jesus is saying, I am that light. It's not an idea. It's not some just fancy thing. No, I am that light. And whoever, regardless of your past, regardless of your issues, regardless of whatever, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, even though you may be walking in the dark. But when I say you will not walk in darkness, it means you are not walking alone. You are not walking without hope. You will not walk in darkness, but they will have the light of what? Your life. You will have the light of life. He's saying, I'm here. The light has come. And so this is my, then my application to encouragement for all of you. Whatever, if you find yourself in a dark place right now, if you don't, you will one day, you know, just, just is. You may be confronted with, a, you know, something regarding your faith or your a relationship or this or that. You all will. If not, I guarantee you all have somebody right now that is in a dark place. And so here is something that you can now help them to show them. And this is the, this is the application right now is, listen, let there be light. Let there be light. It was one of the first phrases that Jesus spoke, that God spoke of the creation of mankind. Let there be light. Listen, a light has come. A light is here. Christ has come. But now it's you saying, listen, let there be light in you. Open up your eyes. Open up your heart. Put your trust in this God who has refused to abandon you, who is here, who is faithful and good. And wants to show you not just your purpose, which is great. He wants to show you and reveal your purpose in life, which there is. But he wants to show you something better. Who he is. That is better. The person of Christ is better than any specific purpose for your life. That he wants you to see all that you have. All that you are in him. No condemnation. Free from performance. So let there be light Allow that light in your heart, in your mind. The more you do that, the more you do that. See, that light does something powerful. When you allow that light in your heart, in your mind, it does something powerful. I'm going to show you. Before you do it, Hugo, hold on. Have you guys ever seen in, um, you know, either TV shows or commercials or movies or whatever, when you see like SWAT teams or, or you know, they go inside of a room to clear the room and it's like really dark, right? They got the gun and their flashlight on one. You ever seen one of those? Uh, mm, mm, mm. There we go. You ever seen that? And you kind of do this little pose here, right? Do that. All right, do me a favor. Turn off all the lights. And so, all right, hopefully no one's scared of the dark. I'll wait for this lights to go too. Hold on. And boom. All right, listen. When it comes to, this is what happens when you allow the light in. When you realize who Jesus is and you place your trust and your confidence, whether if it's in your life or whether it's in a specific circumstance, when you allow the light in, see, here's something that's amazing about light is light always moves. Have you ever seen what does a light do? You know, do we ever describe things as, hey, something's traveling at the speed of dark, right? But, what, but don't we say something's traveling at the speed of light? Because you know why? Light moves. 
light moves. Light came from heaven down to earth. And see, when you allow the light in your heart, when you allow the truth of who God is in your heart, that light is now a search and dis- it's on a search and destroy mission. And it's looking for any lie that is still remaining in your heart that will keep you from the knowledge of God. I'm like, oh, no, oh, exposed, all right? That's a lie that's exposed, and now it's up to you to agree and to, and to re, you know, remove that. And so, God, that light is shining in you, searching, searching your heart, searching for any wickedness. And then it goes, oh, there it is. There's, a, there's something right there that's keeping you from knowing me. I'm sorry, I know it's super bright. And I'm like, yo, right there, you got to choose. You got to choose. Accept it, renounce it, give it to God, and when he does, then it just keeps going and going. When you allow that light in you, God wants to highlight and set you free. He's on a search and destroy mission in your heart for anything that keeps you away from the knowledge of him. Because when you know who God is, when that light increases more and more, when that light increases more and more, the more you can see, the more you can see him. And when you see him, you realize that Jesus says, I am the way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. And when you see Jesus, he shows you the way. He shows you the bigger picture. He shows you how to take the next step. So let there be light in you. Let there be light. No, and I got one more. Oh, wait, turn that one off. I want you to all do me a favor. But I don't want there just to be light in you. Let there be light through you. Check this out. Now, I want you all to take your phones. Get your flashlights out. Everybody get your flashlight out on your phone. Get your flashlight out on your phone. Okay, check it. I'm going to wait for everybody else. Get your flashlights on. It's okay. You don't have to. Look at that. If you got one, good. If not, it's okay. All right. Don't be mean like me and shining in people's eyes. I know I did that, so it's my fault. Guys, look how brighter the room just got. You see that? When there was one light, you can kind of see a little bit. But when everybody got a light, look how much brighter the room got. Here's the thing, guys. When the more promises of God fill your heart, the brighter your heart becomes. When you fill yourself with light, with the promises of God, the more you see who he is, the more you see the step you need to take, the more you realize, oh, see, in the dark, you know what happens in the dark? Your imagination can go out of control. When you're in the dark, your imagination can run wild. But when you shine the light, you're like, oh, oh, my God's bigger. My God's bigger than this issue. My my God's bigger than this question. Or my God still loves me despite this question. My God is bigger. He is bigger. And so when you let light, when you let the light, let there be light in you so God can search and destroy everything inside of you that keeps you away from him. But here you go, ready? With With the flashlights, I want you to kind of like scan around the room because here's what happens. Let there be light through you. Do you know what God wants you to do? When he account, that light in you is a search and destroy mission. But do you know what that light happens now through you? Now you on a search and rescue mission. You on a search and rescue mission. Looking, who else? Who else is in the dark near me? Who, is in, who else is near me that's in the dark that I, where I was? How, how can I shine a light through them? How can I be God's reflection? How can I, you know, put the lights back on in place? And so listen, that's what happens when you let there be light. Boom, there we go, right? <laughs> Good timing. When you let there be light. When you let there be light in you, that light goes on a search and destroy mission in your heart to break down every wall that keeps you from the knowledge of God. And that's all, that's the most important thing you need is who God is. You lean on that. But then also, guys, it is a search and destroy, a search and rescue mission. Listen, let there be light through you. Let there be light through you. I don't care how young you are, old you are, whether you got a job or not in school or whatever. Let there be light through you. Shine that light and I'm gonna make a I'm gonna make a little challenge to myself to you and uh promise and I'll admit it so I, I gotta you know it's embarrassing to say but whatever I'll just, I'll just say it I gotta admit that I have not been shining my light the way I feel like I could or should you know and in the sense of, you know, in, in between Sunday to Mondays and taking opportunities with rather random conversations, actually listening. Lord, you know, is there who around me? How, can you shine a light through me right now or wherever I'm at? Like, is there somebody here that's hurting? Like, if I was them, if I was them and I knew and this other person had the light, I would wish they would say something to me. All right? I would wish they say, I mean, you guys are all here. We are all here because somebody said something to you. You know, somebody said something. And so I'll admit that I haven't been doing that as often. Either, you know, all the excuses I can give you. Oh, I'm busy. None of it's good enough. Okay? 
But I am going to promise you in the next seven days, I am going to make, a, I am going to make an effort, and next week I'm going to shine my light uh, between these couple days. I'm going to tell the story next week. So I have no clue. I'm not staging any of this. I'm just being honest. And so I'm going to do that. Next week I'll tell you my story. So I'm challenging you. I'm doing that so that you can keep me accountable, so I can keep accountable with myself. Because I know that. It's like if I was in a dark place, I would want someone to shine their light. I would want them to show me there was hope. And listen, God wants to transform lives through your faith-filled love. And it's not about you because both Isaiah said it, both Jesus said it. Who is the one who gets the job done? It's God. God will do it. God will do it. God will do it. And he doesn't need you to do it. He invites you, though, to participate. He invites you to come along. He invites you to ride along and see what he can do through you. He invites you to say, hey, 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 you got to see what I'm going to do. And I want to do it through you. And there's not one person here that God cannot rescue and save someone else's life. But I challenge you, listen, let there be light in you. The truth of God in you. Open up your heart to who he is and let there be light through you. I want you to do the same thing. If I'm challenging myself, I'm going to challenge you. To pray this week, who can I shine my light for? Who can I shine my light towards? Maybe it's some, maybe you find your, maybe you're one of your parents, they're in a dark place right now. Shine their light. Shine your light. Maybe they're in a dark place. Maybe one of your kids are in a dark place. Just shine their light. I'm not saying it's going to fix it all, but again, it's a sign, it's a testimony. When we shine our light, we are doing it in faith, saying, God, I'm going to shine my light because I know when I shine my light, you are going to save lives. He does it, not us, not you. It's not on you. It's not on you. It's all on him. He says, I'm going to get it done. But I want to invite you to participate. I want to invite you in on this. He invites us in so many different ways. You saw that. I don't care what your light is. Did you see how bright? Some of y'all's flashlights are better than others. We can tell. You can almost kind of expose yourself, right? And who got the nicer phones and whatnot, right? You can just in that moment right there. Who got the newer phones versus the other ones? You can see that. But it didn't matter. You see how the collective light made a big difference? Listen, if we all shined our light more often, not just on Sundays. Can I just be real? If we shined our light as bright as we did Monday through Saturday compared to so many of us on Sunday for that one hour... Would the world be a different place? Then why are we not? Or why don't we? I can only say that about me. I can't say that about you. I don't know. But it merits. Listen, when I said let there be light, that was the first words God spoke out in the world. Genesis 1-3. And since that day, you know how fast light has been moving since that time? 186,000 miles? Second. And that's flying. 186,000 miles a second. Since the beginning of creation, light has been moving. And light has not once complained, all right, God, can I take a break? You know, I mean, yo, I've been going this fast for a while. You know, light never fluctuates. It doesn't one year go a little slower. One year go, I mean, light has been faithfully flying at 186,000 miles per second. Why? Because light is designed to move. Light moves. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I have, I'm on the move and I want to move you, move your heart. I want to move you out from darkness and into light because light moves. But you know what Jesus also said? I'm going to talk to the church real quick. He says, you are the light of the world. He says, I am the light of the world. You got me? Then now you are the light of the world. And what is light doing? And what does light do? It moves. It moves. Are you moving? Are you moving? Because light is supposed to move. And when it does, God moves in mighty, mighty ways. What if, what if the person, what if you are the answer to somebody else's prayer? And you won't, they won't know and you won't know until you shine. God wants to use you but he wants you he wants to do so much more it's not just use you like for his selfish purposes because he knows that for you it is the best thing for you to step out and refuse to say look not love your lifestyle so much not love how you know your way so much you find all that you've been wanting deep down inside you just don't know how to phrase it you don't know how to ask for it you find it all in him Step out of the dark and into the light. And you're going to find, 
a life that is better than you can imagine.